Uh, and so um, we're particularly pleased uh, that Carl is able to join us. Um, Carl uh, works for the Good Book Company and uh, wrote uh, the book called uh, Easter Uncut. And having chatted briefly yesterday to Carl, I um, know he's married with a couple of kids. Uh, he's worked for uh, the book, Good Book Company for some 12 years, having worked for a, a couple of churches before that, uh, and before that was a journalist. And uh, I, uh, was, uh, I was commiserating with him yesterday that he's uh, so busy as the um, editorial director, one of five directors for the Good Book Company, he doesn't have as much time as he would like to do what he's passionate about, which is, which is writing. But Carl, we um, really appreciate you making time to come and talk to us uh, in the Defence Christian Network um, today uh, for lunchtime. Uh, so I think without further ado, I'm going to hand hand, uh, hand across to you and mute my mic and uh, I'll come back for questions. Um, if you do have questions, perhaps uh, you can either put them in the chat, but very happy um, later on if you want to ask them live, then uh, uh, we'll um, have that opportunity. So Carl will talk for about 20 minutes and then we'll take about 20 minutes for Q&A. Uh, and close with um, uh, 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 around about 12.45. So, Carl, thank you. Over to you. Thank you. And um, thank you uh, to those of you who are on the call. You're, you're giving up your lunch break to listen to me, and I hope um, you're, not, uh, you're not too disappointed by that decision in, in, in 20 minutes or so. I, I also um, wanted to start, um, and I'm not going to resort to cliches by uh, talking about sleeping sounder in our beds and so on, but... I did just want to say thank you. I don't get to speak with those who work in the defence sector uh, very often, if at all, but uh, people like me are very grateful, uh, particularly at the moment, perhaps for people like you. So, um, so thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for what you do uh, when you're not on your lunch breaks. And um, I think the reason I was invited um, uh, to speak with you today is because a few years back, I wrote this little book called Easter Uncut, um, what really happened and why it really matters. Now, to be honest, I never intended on being an author. I came into the publishing world as an editor. That's really my thing, rather than writing books myself. I guess in your terms, I'm more logistics than frontline. But um, for various reasons, I wrote a, a, a Christmas-themed book called Christmas Uncut, which sold pretty well. And so then, of course, our sales guys pointed out that there is another major Christian festival each year and that they'd like uh, to have a book about that as well. And so uh, Easter Uncut uh, became something that that uh, I needed to write. And as it happened, um, just around that time um, of, of starting to write this little book, I'd been sorting through some boxes in our attic and I found a diary that my mum had given me uh, before I went to university. I think it was part of her sort of parental pre-university pet talk about these being important formative years and I needed to make the most of them and not to forget about them and so on. Anyway, she gave me this diary. And I'd, I'd totally, forgo totally forgotten about it and couldn't remember writing in it. Uh, but as I flicked through it, it turned out that I had actually written in that diary every day for a random two month period in the May and June of 2000 in my first year of uni, which happened to be the time that I became a Christian. Uh, the time when uh, uh, through talking with friends and ending up going along to their church, I came to realize that the events of the first Easter, that is the death of Jesus and the rising back to life of Jesus, that those things were not myths, but that they really did happen. And not only had they happened, but that they really mattered for me um, as, a, as a student and have mattered to me ever since. And so finding that diary actually helped me to write the book that became Easter Uncut. And I, I share that story with you because if, uh, if you remember only one thing from the next 20 minutes, um, I'd love it to be this that the resurrection, if true, changes everything. So I'm saying that the, the Christian claim that a man named Jesus died and then after three days rose back to life is not a myth, but a historical fact. But I'm actually saying more than that because I'm saying it's a historical fact that changes, can change your life now. So it's not a fact like uh, the uh, dates that the Anglo-Saxon kings reigned those were things I had to learn for my exams in that term that I was keeping that diary. Um, I can still remember, incidentally, that King Eadred reigned from 946 to 957. And that is a historical fact, but it's one that makes no difference to me today unless it ever crops up as a question in a pub quiz, which seems unlikely. 
The resurrection is not that kind of historical fact. I want to suggest it's a historical fact like the historical fact that happened to me on the 20th of August 2005, which was the date I got married to my wife. Now, that is no more of a historical fact than the Adred's reign was. But the difference is that it changes how I live every day and how I think about myself and how I think about my future. And so for 20 minutes or so, as Rhett said, I just want us uh, to, to think about the events of the first Easter Sunday and ask, firstly, did they really happen? And then I want to suggest a few reasons why they really matter. <clears throat> so firstly, did it really happen? Uh, by the way, this is one of the great things about Christianity. Christianity is based on historical claims, not on feelings or intuitions or experiences. It stands or it falls on whether there was a day in history when Jesus actually rose from the dead. But of course, that's the point at which a lot of people, and maybe you, start to think, well, th that is just ridiculous. Uh, I mean, a dead man coming back to life simply doesn't happen. It is obviously stupid. Now, of course, no one can prove beyond any doubt that Jesus rose from the dead. But that's because no one can prove anything beyond any doubt. I can't, for example, prove that my my wife loves me. But based on the evidence, I believe that she does. You can't prove that you are not, in fact, a butterfly who is simply dreaming that it's a human. But based on the evidence, you believe that you're not actually a butterfly, I hope. So in thinking about whether Jesus rose or not, what we're thinking about is what is what is the most likely explanation that fits the facts of what happened that day in history? That day in history when some women who had been friends with this man, Jesus, for several years, who had seen him die three days previously, went to his tomb to rub spices on his body to stop it uh, stinking in the Middle Eastern heat. But when they got there, instead of finding a corpse, they found a tomb that was empty. What is the explanation that best fits those facts? And what is the explanation that best fits the facts that just a few weeks after that event, some of Jesus's other friends stood up and basically said that Jesus, who had been killed on a cross in that city, was now alive. What explanation best fits the discovery of the empty tomb? No one, not even Jesus's enemies and opponents, denied that the tomb was empty. So the question becomes, why was it empty? Now, here are some explanations that people have come up with. Firstly, maybe Jesus wasn't actually dead. He had fainted on the cross. And then when he was in the coolness of the tomb, he'd 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 come round, he'd revived. And then he walked out of the tomb, spent some time with his friends before leaving to live somewhere else. And so his friends misunderstood what had happened and thought that he had really been dead and therefore had risen. Now, to opt for that explanation, you're going to firstly need to believe that the squad of Roman soldiers um, who have been in charge of his crucifixion, Roman soldiers who were perhaps the group in all of history who are best at killing people, you're going to need to believe that they made a mistake when they crucified him. And then you've got to believe that after being nailed to a cross and having a, steer, a spear stuck in his side, three days later, Jesus was able to walk out of his tomb, get around the guards who had been set to watch it, and go and eat food and go for a long week, walk with some of his friends. In other words, you're going to need to believe that Jesus was able to do the kinds of things that men who have been crucified for hours and stabbed through the side simply can't do. OK, so next explanation possible. Uh, Jesus's friends had been driven mad with the grief of his death and therefore they they saw hallucinations. They so wanted him to be alive that they they saw him alive as a hallucination. But they believed in those hallucinations and they thought they'd seen Jesus, even though they hadn't. Well, medics, and I'm not a medic, but medics I've read on the issue would would have a problem with this because group hallucinations where lots of different people all see the same thing are vanishingly rare. But of course, more than that, if this was a hallucination, then the tomb wasn't empty. The body was still really there. And any opponent of Jesus and Jesus's friends could have just pointed that out. So maybe then the tomb was empty because someone had taken the body. Three suspects uh, for who would have taken the body. First, the religious authorities could have taken it. They were no friends of Jesus. They hated the Jesus movement, if we can call it that. 
And so in order to make sure that Jesus's friends didn't steal the body themselves and claim a resurrection, the religious authorities thought they'd look after it. But of course, if those authorities had stolen the body, then as soon as Jesus's friends claimed that Jesus was alive, the authorities would have produced the body and killed the movement stone dead. But they never did. So maybe then it was some grave robbers. But the problem is that the grave robbers would have had to have got in and out without the guards noticing. And when those women found no body in the tomb on the first Easter Sunday, what they did find was the valuable linen grave clothes still in the tomb. So these are thieves who are clever enough to get round the Roman guards, but stupid enough to leave the only thing of value behind as they lug a dead body out with them. And so the third uh, suspect for who stole the body is by far the most likely. And it's the option, if you like, that people who don't believe in the resurrection most often believe in. And it's that Jesus's friends, the disciples, took the body themselves. They then invented a multitude of appearances of Jesus to them uh, and announced that, he, they, that, that Jesus had risen back to life. And these disciples had every motive to do this because they had pledged loyalty to Jesus as their king. They had believed that he was God. They had given up much to follow him. And so they looked pretty stupid when he was killed. And they had much to gain from claiming that he'd risen because then they would be the leaders of a new religion. This would give them power. This would give them wealth. This would give them a place in history. So they had motive. Question is, of course, did they also have means? Could they have outwitted the guards who were guarding the, temp uh, guarding the tomb? But let's imagine for a moment that they could and that they did and that they removed the body. You've then got two questions to deal with. First, when these disciples wrote up their accounts of what had happened, what we call the four Gospels in the Bible, they presented themselves as being weak and scared and disloyal and cowardly. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were making up a story that I was a part of, I would want to write myself into it as being of at least average courage and conviction. I would not want to go down in history as a, a weak coward. But actually, that's not the biggest question to ask if the disciples stole the body. The big issue is that of the 11 disciples who were around when Jesus, they claimed, rose, of those 11, all but one of them were killed for their claim that Jesus had come back to life and was therefore God. Now, if they'd taken the body, they knew that that claim was a lie. They would all have been dying for something they knew wasn't true. And so you have to ask, wouldn't at least one of them have admitted that it was all made up in order to avoid being crucified or stoned to death or beheaded? You would have to believe that all 10 of those men went to their deaths for something that they knew to be a lie. So here's then the last option. It's the Christian option, if you like. It's that the Bible's claim is true, that there is a God who came to earth as the man Jesus. And then on the first Easter Sunday, he proved who he is by doing something that only a divine being could do, namely rising from the dead. Now to me, back when I was at university as a first year history student, that, that seemed to me to be the explanation that by far best fit the facts. And 22 years later, having experienced the difference that Jesus makes in my life, it's, it, it's not that I don't ever have any doubts about all this. In fact, I think it's healthy for all of us to question our basic assumptions and beliefs from time to time, whatever religion or worldview we hold to. But the thing is that when I do have doubts, I can return to the facts and the evidence of the resurrection claim. And every time I do so, it still seems to me that resurrection is the only explanation that truly does justice to the evidence and the facts. So if you're on this call and you're someone who doesn't think that Jesus rose from the dead or you're not sure, well, firstly, thanks so much for coming. And thanks for hanging in there until now. It's easy on a, on a team's call to just uh, sort of log off, isn't it? So thank you for being here still. Secondly, let, let me ask you, is there a better historical explanation for the events of the first Easter Sunday? To put it another way, what are you needing to believe in order not to believe in the resurrection?
as a friend of mine puts it, uh, to believe in the resurrection is not actually to follow a preconception or prejudice. It is to follow the historical evidence. The Bible doesn't ask you to shut your eyes and make a leap of faith. Instead, it encourages you to open your eyes, look at the evidence and make a step of faith. And I'd love for you to do that, to look at and think about and weigh up the evidence, because it does really matter. If Jesus did rise from the dead, it's absolutely wonderful news. In fact, that is the best news ever. I want very quickly to tell you three things that the resurrection, if true, can mean for us today. And they're based on three things that those first gospel accounts record Jesus himself as saying. Uh, to help me remember them and hopefully to help you remember them, all of them begin with a P quite conveniently. So first of all, the resurrection means that Jesus's promises can be trusted. Jesus had promised in the weeks before he was killed, I will die and then after three days rise again. He was so sure about this that he said it on at least three different occasions to a multitude of different people and no one, not even his closest friends, actually believed him. But if he then did rise from the dead three days after being killed, then he kept that promise. And that means that he can be trusted to keep all his promises. Now, Jesus has made a lot of promise, promises. He's promised his guidance and his power for people who trust him. He's promised that living with him in charge of life is actually the most satisfying way to live. He's promised to return to the world one day to bring justice and peace and a new start. He's promised to bring all his friends into eternal, perfect life with him. Now, those are huge promises. Those are hard to believe promises, except they're no bigger or harder than to be dead and then rise from the dead. If Jesus did that, if Jesus kept that promise, then we can be confident that he will keep all his promises. Second, the resurrection means that we, you, can have peace with God. Jesus' first, first words to his male friends after he'd risen were, peace be with you. And that is an amazing thing for him to say to them because they had been useless friends to him. When he was arrested in his hour of greatest need, when he was on trial for his life, they had deserted him. They had denied even knowing him. And yet Jesus still loved them. And so he didn't turn up after his resurrection and say, you let me down or we are no longer friends after what you've done, or you better do better next time. Instead, he said, peace be with you. That is, even despite how you've treated me, we are the closest of friends. He's forgiven them. And that was great news for them. And actually, it's great news for us because we haven't treated God properly either. This is God's world. And despite appearances, sometimes it is at its base, a rules-based world. And the maker is the one who gets to make the rules. The problem is that each of us decide to live in conflict with him instead of obeying him. We, we fight him for his world. We decide to live in charge ourselves. We decide to live in rebellion against him. We have picked a fight with God, and that's an unwinnable fight. I don't know if you've ever had a row with a loved one in the morning and then it's nagged at you all day long. Well, well, however well everything else has gone in that day, that nagging, there's that nagging feeling that you've still had a row with your spouse or your kids or whoever. Or maybe that you've experienced um, the fear that your boss is going to fire you. And that fear has nagged at you all the time, even when you're enjoying time with friends and family over the weekend or whatever. Well, what should nag at us most? is that we're not at peace with God and that we're facing the consequences of our conflict beyond death. And if we have that nagging feeling, and we should, then it becomes great news that Jesus, having died and risen, is able and willing to forgive us if we ask, to offer us peace with him, with God, now and forever, a peace that we don't deserve, but is the thing that we most desperately need. So the promises of Jesus can be trusted. Peace with God is on offer. Very quickly, thirdly, Jesus gives the presence of God. Uh, Forty days after the events of the first Easter Sunday and some of his last words before he returned to heaven, Jesus said to his friends, his followers, I will be with you always. 
In other words, if the resurrection is true, it means that Jesus, that God himself, offers to walk through life with us by his spirit, to be with us in every difficulty, every disaster, every sadness, every struggle, so that we're never really alone, we're never completely defeated, and we're never without love. Not only that, but it means that Jesus will take us to be present with him beyond death. The resurrection shows that this life is not all there is and that we don't need to deny the reality of death. We don't need to downplay it by using cliches for it, but we don't need to despair about it either. Instead, we can see death as a doorway, a doorway through to a life that is actually far better than this one. A doorway that Jesus passed through himself on the first Good Friday and Easter Sunday and that he offers to walk us through as well on the day that we face death. So it's not just, I hope you can see, that the resurrection is a historical fact. That's the claim, and I'd argue that it's true. It's not just that. It's that this is a past event that can change everything about our present and our future. It's a, it's a reality that can give us hope on our hardest days. Because if we accept the risen Jesus as our king and our forgiver, then the resurrection promises that our best days always lie ahead of us. So if you're a Christian listening in today, then if you're anything like me, you find it very easy to forget and much harder to remember how amazing it is to know the promises and the peace and the presence of Jesus. And I hope that these 20 minutes or so have caused you to smile. Smile because the resurrection is not just true, but changes everything. And if you're listening in, either live or on the recording, as, as someone who's thinking through what you believe about life, about death, about God, about Jesus, about everything, then I hope that what I've said has encouraged you to take seriously the evidence for Jesus's resurrection on that day in history. Because if he rose, then he can change your life and he can change your future in the most wonderful way. Well, that's enough perhaps more than enough from me. Um, but um, Rhett promised a, a Q&A time, so I'm going to sort of hand back over to, to, to Rhett for that. Carl, thank you so much. I love it, uh, looking at that compelling evidence. And I know uh, plenty of uh, barristers, policemen, uh, and in fact, doctors and others, medics have looked at it and uh, come to that conclusion that uh, what the Bible says is true. And uh, the promises from Jesus, the peace with God and the presence of God. Uh, great uh, out, outputs. I should say that um, we've had a kind offer that um, if anyone would like Carl's book, Easter Uncut, uh, then uh, uh, if you send your address to um, the email I'll put in the chat, uh, office at afsu.org.uk, uh, your name and address, then uh, Gemma, our admin assistant, will uh, pop it in the post in uh, the next couple of weeks. So uh, I'll just do that now while I while I think about it, and uh, uh, and then you can um, do that if you so wish. Um, I should also add that um, uh, if you are a, a member of a um, a Christian workplace group or the Catholic Military Association or uh, the Soldiers and Airmen Scripture Readers Association or my own organisation that I work for. Uh, the Armed Forces Christian Union, then you're automatically a member of the Defence Christian Network and you're very welcome here. Uh, and if you're visiting, you're especially welcome if you're not a member of DCN um, and would like to be. I'll again put some details shortly in the chat. But I'd love to hear some questions. Uh, if anybody's got questions, either put them in the chat and uh, we'll pick them up. Um, or if um, uh, if you want to unmute and uh, ask Carl a question uh, around the resurrection, uh, around uh, particularly as it pertains to the Christian faith, then uh, uh, then the floor is yours. I can hear a ping, but I can't see anything. Uh, Carl, I wonder, I, you know, the Western world, we're, we're very wealthy. We have a rich history of um, uh, Christianity, and yet so many people have turned away. Uh, and, and yet we, we enjoy, you know, a high level of education and other things. Why, why do you think we in the West are so anti-Christian when, when actually so many other parts of the world, uh, there's a, um, a, a, 
an exciting renewal, really, or a, or a, a revival of Christian faith. Mm. Well, I, I suppose, uh, firstly, it, it maybe suggests that, um, you know, we, we tend to see education as um, as as something that means that we're better at discerning truth. Um, I suppose that's an assumption that's that's um, untested. And um, and so it, it, it may be actually that being educated does not necessarily help you to discern uh, the, the best way to live. Um, I know plenty of people who have PhDs and have managed to make a, rather a car crash of their lives. Um, equally, I know some people who, you know, have never been in, in any way academically um, able and really struggled in school and yet seem to be able to um, discern the wisest way to live. So I suppose maybe we tend to make that link in, in the West that education equals ability to, to discern truth. Perhaps that's not uh, uh, quite the case. I guess as well, the more we, the, the more stuff we have in this world, and in the West we tend to have more than average, and certainly more than has ever been the case historically. Uh, the more kind of invested we become in um, this life, and the more unable we become to look look beyond it. And I think what's happened in the West um, is that uh, we have manage to make death something that we don't think about. So we have euphemisms for it. Um, now, I know I'm, I'm talking to people who probably have seen dead bodies, but the vast majority of people in the West have never seen a dead body, whereas 50 years ago, you know, if, you're, if your grandfather died or whatever, he, he would be laid out in the front room. And, um, and, and until the funeral, there would be a dead body in the house. And so death was, was something that was very real to people. Now it isn't. And I think that means that um, people can get away with pretending that death doesn't exist and therefore uh, concentrate on life now as though it won't come to an end. Um, whereas I think people in the developing world are much more aware that death is a reality and that you need an answer to death. Now, most of my friends simply don't have an answer to death. Um, and if they do, it's one that they're assuming without any evidence, like there's nothing after death, or I'm sure if I'm a good person, there's a God, I'll be fine. Uh, of course, the Christian claim is that we can know what happens after death because somebody has come from the spiritual realm, if I can put it like that, in order to, to reveal what we otherwise couldn't know. And that's Jesus, the son of God, who does things, did things that only God could do, partly to prove that what he says is is trustworthy. Um, and so for my money, I'd much rather trust what he says about what follows after death than sort of my best guess, uh, given that I've never been there. Thank you. Uh, that's that's really interesting. I've not sort of heard it explained uh, so clearly uh, before in that way, but that's really helpful. Um, I'm going to pick up just a, a few of these questions. Forgive me if I don't get to all the questions, but um, a question here from Richard. Do you think the key challenge is being open to the idea of the supernatural being at the core of the issues around the rex resurrection? Yes, I have a, a friend, uh, he's an evangelist called, called uh, Glenn Scrivener, who um, he points out that um, we, we all believe in a miracle because um, if you are a, an atheistic naturalist, you believe that everything came from nothing. Um, and uh, and and that was the, the, the big bang. Um, you, you believe that that just happened. Um, Christians believe in in the miracle of uh, something coming from nothing in the in the womb of Mary when uh, when the Holy Spirit uh, caused her to become pregnant. So actually, in a way, we all believe in, if you like, uh, miracles, things that cannot be explained, actually, by the way, by, by uh, you know, the laws of nature. And so you've got to kind of choose your miracle. So actually, I don't I don't think there's anyone, even Richard Dawkins, I'm sure he would disagree, who, who who doesn't actually believe in things that cannot be explained uh, uh, scientifically, if you like. Um, uh, I mean, actually, if you believe that your spouse loves you, then um, you believe in something that cannot be scientifically proven. Um, so. So, yes, I think the the issue is um, that if somebody rules out what they think of as supernatural miracles, before we even start, then clearly the resurrection cannot happen. Mm -hmm. um, but I would gently suggest, if that's 
you on the call or, or, or suggest maybe gently to, to my friends who, who think like that, that actually that's not very open minded. Um, that is deciding what cannot have happened before you've looked at the evidence, um, which is the, the definition actually of being closed minded. And so if we're not to be closed minded, if we're to be open minded, we need to accept that there is the possibility of the supernatural and the possibility of the supernatural breaking into the natural, um, which I would suggest is exactly the explanation that best fits the uh, indisputable facts of the first Easter Sunday. Thank you. Thank you. Um, question from Yvonne here, um, I, uh, one I've not uh, come across <coughs> before. The first Christian missionaries regularly met Buddhist missionaries. How did the Buddhists contribute to the idea of the resurrection? Oh, that, that's a great question. Let me let me think about that for a moment. Um, so, um, Yvonne, feel free to um, tell me that I'm wrong on this. I think that it would be correct to say that early Christian missionaries met with and interacted with early Buddhist missionaries, or not early because Buddhism is so much older, um, but not that the first missionaries, as in the disciples of Jesus did. They um, were located um, uh, much more in the Greco-Roman world. They had not yet, most of them at least, had not yet gone east to uh, India. It's possible that Thomas did, uh, but he didn't write any of the first Gospels. So that's that. That's part of an answer. The second one would be to say, and, and my next door neighbour is a Chinese Buddhist, and we have long discussions. So I feel, uh, well, at least more able to answer your question than I would have done a few years ago. Um, I think the big difference, of course, uh, between Buddhism and Christianity, one of the big differences is uh, the idea of reincarnation and the circularity of um, of history. That things things are going round and round and round rather than the idea that um, we, we do not return to this life. Um, death is the end of this life. And then we go on to one of two uh, existences, the perfection of the presence of God, which is what we were created to enjoy, or the uh, experience of being without God's blessings or any of the good things that God gives, um, uh, an existence with no where we get what we choose actually uh having chosen uh to, to not have god as king but it's actually an existence that is without hope without anything good and without any prospect of that changing um so so fundamentally i think the christian view of history as being linear it's heading somewhere it's heading towards the return of jesus and the christian view of what happens when we die is, is fundamentally different to the Buddhist understanding of history as being circular and our death as leading to a reincarnation. The other thing I would say is that Christianity and Buddhism have very, very different views on uh, the whole nature of suffering. And I think uh, you didn't ask me about that, so I'm not going to talk to it, but uh, that is a, a fundamental difference, actually. And it seems to me in discussion with my neighbour that Christianity is able to both hold to the reality of suffering and accept the reality of the pain of suffering uh, but have an answer that gives hope in that suffering in a way that's uh, that, that, that's very different to buddhism or indeed any other way of looking at the world thank you thank you carl i hope that helps uh, that that answers that uh, helps answer that question yvonne uh, one from kate we're all surrounded by non-believers which would suggest that that, that, that kate is a uh, is a Christian believer. How would you suggest we take the truth to uh, those who don't believe in a compelling way? Yes, uh, uh, <laughs> no, not, I'm not an expert, uh, Kate. Um, I think, firstly, uh, it's about living a life that is that that silently speaks, if you like, to the fact that uh, Christians have a hope that. Um, that non-Christians or atheists in particular simply do not have. And we have a confidence in where we're heading um, that those of other religions where you need to do well enough to get whatever the afterlife is uh, also don't have. So I think part of it is, is that when we face difficulty, when we face crisis, when we face losing something that's dear to us or someone that's dear to us, uh, we need to respond in a way that shows that Christianity really does make a difference. Uh, second thing is, I think just talking about 
um, about our, our faith in everyday conversation. I think we're, we're very nervous of doing so, and I don't think we need to be or should be. Um, I think if somebody's got a problem, I would say to them, well, I'm going to I'm going to pray for you if that's all right. Um, not literally there and then, but I just mean I'm going to tell them that I'm going to be praying for them. If somebody asked me what I did at the weekend. I'm going to tell them what was exciting about church on Sunday rather than the fact that, you know, my team won or lost on Saturday afternoon or the kids didn't give me any sleep or whatever it might be. So, uh, so I think just talking about it naturally, uh, showing the difference it makes in our lives and then being willing to um, uh, to take the risk. And to say, you know, I'd love to talk with you about this. I'd love you to come to this uh, event that, you know, Christian Defence Network or my church or whoever is is running. I think, um, or, you know, I th again, we, we we get so nervous about these things, but I don't feel nervous about saying to my neighbours, do you want to come to the football on Saturday afternoon? And if they say, no, I don't like football, that's fine. I don't mind. I don't worry. Um, and I think I need to be the same in, in how I talk to people saying, would you like to come to church? Would you like to come to this event? If they say no, it's not for me. It's OK. Don't need to worry. Um, but just being a bit more on the front foot in terms of uh, inviting people and talking to people. The other thing I find is people are genuinely interested. I, I, I think there's this thing that Christians tell each other that nobody cares, nobody's interested, and nobody's going to listen. And because we convince ourselves of that, we then don't talk to people and then nobody is it seems interested and so we it sort of becomes a self-fulfilling negative prophecy i think people are quite interested actually in christians who really believe what they say they believe and have a hope and a confidence for the future and a way of living today that makes sense to them and a way of confronting suffering and disappointment i think people are interested but we just need to maybe be a bit more on the front foot in terms of just talking to them about it in conversation i hope that's helpful Thank you. Thank you. That That's great. Um, yeah, it, there's a comment or a, a phrase. There's no uh, there's no atheist in a foxhole. And my, my experience is often when the chips are down, when, when life is quite tough or something unexpected happens. That's when uh, certainly what, in my experience, soldiers would come up to me. Uh, and a few weeks ago, I was uh, uh, away uh, a bench training with uh, with my unit, which is mainly ex regulars, 20, 30, 40 years of, of service. And uh, I had an amazing opportunity one evening after after dinner where they started asking questions. And for about 30 minutes, I answered and then uh, I felt that it was time to allow the conversation to move on. But people were genuinely interested uh, in, in, in exploring Christian faith. Uh, one here from uh, from Ollie. Um, uh, Carl, what do you think the uh, current sort of Jewish t uh, position is on 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 the Easter story? On the um, uh, do you do you want to talk to that briefly? Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> just trying to find the, the Jewish. Uh, so, if I understand your question correctly, I think you're asking me what do Jews make of the Christian claim. Um, yeah. Yeah. um and i mean so obviously they, they they would say that uh jesus was a um at best a, a teacher at worst a charlatan um and certainly that he was not the long promised uh, uh messiah and therefore that um he didn't rise from the dead um so they've got to come up with a with an alternative explanation um and I, I guess they would be along the lines of the ones that we that we looked at earlier. Um, you, you'd have to. I mean, I don't want to speak. Well, no, I mean, no, no one Jew could speak for every Jew anyway. But um, I, I, I certainly don't want to speak for them. Um, I think um, it is interesting um, if you read uh, books like Case for Christ. There are a reasonable number, actually, of of Jews who became Christians because they saw how actually the 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 number of prophecies in the Old Testament in the scriptures that Jews and Christians hold in common uh, were were met fulfilled in the life and the death and the resurrection of of Jesus that actually the person that we should be expecting to come if we read our Old Testaments is the person who we see uh, living dying and rising in in the New Testament Gospels I, I have a friend um, uh, who uh, it's from a very Jewish family, actually very high profile Jewish family. His, his, his father was a major uh, UK politician um, uh, 20 years ago. Or so and um, and he became a Christian at school because somebody showed him how the, the prophecies of the Old Testament matched up with with the life of Jesus in the, in the New Testament. And 
um, much to the consternation of his family, he, he he became a Christian because he realized that Jesus had risen and had fulfilled the prophecies. Well, yeah, I hope that uh, answers your question. If it if it doesn't, I'm sorry. That's great. I, I had the privilege a few years ago, um, we took a tour out to Israel and it was just after Passover, after Easter. And uh, I sat next to one of these Orthodox Christians, uh, a British guy with 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 hat and tails and uh, the full teats. And for five hours, we had exactly this conversation. And I, I suppose the the bottom line is he, he, he said, well, Jesus was a, a false messiah. And I said, well, what are you looking for in the Messiah? And he described basically what you read in Revelation. Uh, that he will come back triumphant and um, bring it, all things to a close and, and judge all people. So thank you, Carl. Um, there's uh, a, a, Rob has asked a, a question. How many people do you think don't believe in resurrection because they don't see it happening on a day to day basis? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. The Well, if I saw it, I believe in it um, sort of objection. Um, I, I think. And. Um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if you're on the call and this is you and it's not fair of you. I, I think that's normally a uh, an excuse for not looking at it properly, uh, because once we've invested quite a lot of our lives in the resurrection not being true so that we don't have to take Jesus seriously and take him at his word, uh, then by nature, we will find any reason we can not to. Uh, not to believe in something that, while wonderful, would also cause us to have to change our lives and accept that we've been wrong and so on. So, um, so I, I say that because people people believe in lots and lots of things that we cannot see on a day to day basis. Um, uh, you know, we we can't see most of the universe. Um, I know that sounds trite, but it's true. Um, I, I can't see Australia, um, but I. But I'm perfectly happy to accept that all kinds of things are happening out in the universe, down in the deepest oceans and so on um, that I can't see. Second thing is, if if the resurrection was if, if resurrection was an everyday sort of event, then the objection would come. Well, it's an everyday event, so it doesn't prove anything about Jesus because they happen. People rise from the dead all the time. So you, you can't kind of can't have it both ways. If 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 God came to Earth, then to prove it rightly, we should demand some evidence as in him doing things that only somebody who is not merely a human can do. So what would those kind of things be? Well, it would be to show that you have authority over the laws of nature and to show that you can do you can you can unwind, if you like, something that no human can unwind like death. Well, that's exactly what we see in the life of Jesus. But then they would be unique events that don't happen on a day to day basis. So we can't say both. Well, I'd like to see it happening, you know, right in front of me. Otherwise, I can't believe in it. We can't say that and also say that to prove he's God, Jesus has got to do things that don't happen on a day to day basis. That's great. Carl, um, it's been an absolute pleasure and delight having you uh, on our lunchtime talk. I'm conscious we're hard up against 12.45 and I want to honour and respect that for those who uh, haven't already left. So on behalf of all of us, thank you very much. Uh, I know you work for the Good Book Company. Uh, do you want to uh, say anything uh, very briefly about the Good Book Company? Oh, um, yes, thank you. So, yes, the Good Book Company is a, a, a Christian publisher, evangelical Christian publisher, um, um, one of the largest in, in the UK. Um, and basically, we, we we simply seek to publish books that are, are biblical, that hold to the truth of the Bible, that are relevant to normal people's normal lives and that are accessible. So, um, not just for people who've, you know, got a, got a PhD in theology and uh, or have been to church all their lives and understand all the Christian jargon and so on. So we publish things that are for non-Christians who are looking into the faith. Uh, and then we publish lots of things uh, helping people get into the Bible for themselves. So if if you're interested in looking at what we publish, um, you can just go to thegoodbook.co.uk, uh, thegoodbook.co.uk um, and, and, and see the range of um, uh, of books and if I could just plug one um, if if you're a Christian or not a Christian um, we have a book coming out in May called The Air We Breathe by Glenn Scrivener actually it may launch in June but in the next couple of months fantastic book just showing how actually the values that uh, the secular west holds to um, kindness consent um, uh, progress science education all these things uh, are actually very Christian values they don't make sense without Christianity 
and actually when people criticize uh, Christianity or the church as as they should from time to time they're using very Christian values to do so so it's just a fantastic book if you're not a Christian to think about the effect that Christianity has had maybe without you knowing on your values uh, but also as a Christian just to give you confidence uh, and maybe a way of having those conversations with people when they talk about uh, justice and kindness and compassion and tolerance and so on say well actually let, let's think about why you think that's so important uh, so it's called the air we breathe by a, a guy called glenn scrivener and i i just recommend it to you that's excellent well thank you very much and uh uh, thank you for joining us. If anyone wants to follow up on any of this, please do email office at afcu.org.uk. And uh, if you're interested, you're all welcome to, to join AFCU. It, it's free. Um, we uh, have a history going back to 1851 of praying for the armed forces and we organise 30 to 40 events a year. Um, and uh, it's been a great privilege and honour to, to link with uh, the D, uh, the Defence Christian Network, and uh, on behalf of all of us, Carl, thanks again. Take care. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Cheers. <laughs>